Hermes. It is indeed significant that a man of such outstanding intellect as Johannes Kepler should have been moved at the very dawn of modern scientific development to express the feelings that came over him while he was engaged in astronomical research in words somewhat as follows. Quote, During my attempt to discover the manner of the passing of the planets around the sun, I have sought to peer into the deep secrets of the cosmos, the while it has often seemed as if my fancy had led me into the mysterious sanctuaries of the old Egyptians, to touch their most holy vessels, and draw them forth that I might bestow them upon a new world. At such moments the thought has come to me that only in the future will the true purport and intent of my message be disclosed. Close quote. It is of great importance to spiritual science to follow the gradual development of the human spirit from epoch to epoch as it slowly evolves and, pressing ever upward, emerges from the dark shadows of the past. Hence it is that the study of ancient Egyptian culture and spiritual life is of especial moment. This is found to be particularly the case when we endeavor to picture and live in the atmosphere and conditions associated with the latter. The echoes that reach us from the dim gray vistas of bygone times seem as full of mystery as is the countenance of the Sphinx itself, which stands so grimly as a monument to ancient Egyptian civilization. This mystery becomes intensified as modern external scientific research finds that it is constrained to delve ever deeper and deeper into the remote past in order to throw light upon later Egyptian culture, regarding which most important documents are extant. Such investigations have found traces of certain things clearly related to the active cultural life of Egypt that date back to a period at least 7,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era. Here, then, is one reason why this particular civilization is of such paramount interest. But there is another. Although they live in times of broader and more general enlightenment, present-day human beings, nevertheless, have a feeling, whether acceptable or not, that this ancient culture is in some singular and mysterious manner connected with their own aims and ideals. Here we find one of the greatest scientists of modern times, overcome by a sense of such close relation to the ancient Egyptian culture, that he could find no better way of expressing the fundamental concepts underlying his work than by representing them as a regeneration, naturally differing as to word and form, of the occult doctrines taught to the disciples and followers in the bygone Egyptian sanctuaries. It is, therefore, a matter of the greatest interest to us that we should realize the actual sentiments of these olden Egyptian peoples in regard to the whole meaning and nature of their civilization. There is an ancient legend that has been handed down through Greek tradition which is now suggestive which is most suggestive not only of what the Egyptians themselves felt regarding their culture, but also of the way in which their civilization was looked upon by the ancients as a whole. We are told that an Egyptian sage once said to Solon, quote, You Greeks are still children, you have never grown up, and all your knowledge has been acquired through your own human observation and senses. You have neither traditions nor doctrines gray with age. Close quote. We first learn what is implied by the expression doctrines gray with age when the methods of spiritual science are employed in the effort to throw light upon the nature and significance of Egyptian thought and feeling. As has been stated earlier, when we approach this matter we must bear in mind that during successive periods of their development human beings gradually acquired different forms of consciousness. The order of conscious apprehension that is ours today, with its scientific method of thought, 
through which we realize the outer world by virtue of our senses working in conjunction with reason and intellect, did not always exist. Deep down, underlying all human cognition, there is what we term evolution, and evolution affects not only the outer world of form, but also the disposition of the human soul. It follows that we can really understand the events that took place at the ancient centers of culture only when we accept that knowledge which spiritual science can alone obtain from the sources of information at its disposal. We thus learn that in olden times, instead of our present intellectual consciousness, there existed a clairvoyant state that differed from our customary normal conscious condition, of which we are aware from the moment we awake until we again fall asleep. On the other hand, the ancient clairvoyant state cannot be likened to the insensibility produced by slumber. Hence, the primeval consciousness of the prehistoric human being should be regarded as an intermediate condition, now only faintly apparent and retained, one might say, atavistically, in the form of an attenuated heritage in the picture world of our dreams. Dreams are, for the most part, chaotic in character and therefore meaningless in their relation to ordinary life. But the old clairvoyant consciousness, which also found expression in imagery, though often of a somewhat subdued and visionary nature, was nevertheless a truly clairvoyant gift. And its symbolical manifestations had reference not to our physical world, but to that realm that lies beyond all material things, in other words, the world of spirit. We can say that in reality all clairvoyant consciousness including the dream state of the primitive human being, as well as that acquired today through those methods to which we have previously referred, finds expression pictorially and not in concepts and ideas, as is the case with externalized physical consciousness. It is for the possessor of such a faculty to interpret the symbols presented in terms of those spiritual realities that underlie all physical perceptual phenomena. We have now reached a point where we can look back on the evolution of the ancient races and say for certain that those wondrous visions of bygone times of which tradition tells us were not born of childish fantasy and false conception of the works of nature. Parenthesis. This, as I have pointed out, is the widespread opinion in materialistic circles of today. Close parenthesis but were in truth pictures of the spirit world flashed before the souls of human beings in that now long distant past. One who seriously studies the old mythologies and legends, not from the point of view of modern materialistic thought, but with an understanding of the creation and spiritual activities of humankind, will find in these strange stories a certain coherence that harmonizes wonderfully with those cosmic principles that dominate all physical, chemical, and biological laws. There rings throughout the ancient mythological and religious systems a tone of spiritual reality from which they acquire a true significance. We must clearly realize that the peoples of the various nations each according to disposition, temperament, and racial or folk character, formed different conceptions of that vision world in which they conceived higher powers to be actively operating behind the accustomed forces of nature. Further, during the gradual course of evolution, humankind passed through many transitionary stages between that of the consciousness of the ancients and our present-day objective conscious state. As time went on, the power necessary to the old clairvoyance dimmed and the visions faded. One might say that the doors leading to the higher realms were slowly closed, so that the pictures manifested to those whose souls could still peer into the spirit world held less and less spiritual force, until toward the end only the lowest stages of supersensible activity could be apprehended. 
Finally, this primeval clairvoyant power died out in so far as humanity in general was concerned, and humanity's vision became limited to that which is of the material world and to the apprehension of physical concepts and things. From that time on, the study of the interrelation of these factors led step by step to the birth of modern science. Thus it came about that when the old clairvoyant state was passed, our present intellectual consciousness gradually developed in diverse ways among the different nations. The mission of the Egyptian peoples was of a very special nature. All that we know regarding ancient times, even that knowledge attained through modern Egyptian research, if rightly understood, tends to verify the statements of spiritual science regarding the allotted task and true purpose of the Egyptian race. It was ordained that these olden peoples should still be imbued with a sufficiency of that primal power which would enable them to look back into the misty past when their leaders, by virtue of outstanding individualities and highly developed clairvoyant faculties, could gaze far into the mysteries of the spirit world. Bracket, spiritual science asserts that it was in accordance with quote, the great eternal plan close quote, that the Egyptians should gain wisdom and understanding from this source to be a guide and a benefit to the development of humankind. Close bracket. And we have learned that it was to this end that this great nation was still permitted to retain a certain measure of that fast-fading clairvoyant power so closely associated with a specific disposition of soul. Although these qualities were at that time weak and waning in intensity, nevertheless they continued to be active until a comparatively late period in Egyptian history. We can therefore make this statement. The Egyptians, until less than a thousand years before the Christian era, had actual experience of a mode of vision differing from that with which we are familiar in everyday life, when we merely open our eyes and make use of our intellect. They knew that through this gift humans were enabled to behold the spiritual realms. The later Egyptians, however, were unable to penetrate beyond the nethermost regions, as portrayed in their pictorial visions. Nonetheless, they had power to recall those bygone times in the golden age of Egyptian culture, when their priesthood could gaze both far and deeply into the world of spirit. All knowledge obtained through visions was most carefully guarded and secretly preserved for thousands of years with the greatest piety, thankfulness, and religious feeling, especially by the older Egyptians. At a later period, those among the people who still retained some clairvoyant power expressed themselves in this fashion, quote, We can yet discern a lower spiritual realm. We know, therefore, that it is possible for humankind to look upon a spirit world. To question this truth would be as sensible as to doubt that we can really see external objects with our eyes. Close quote. Although these later Egyptians were able to apprehend only weak echoes, as it were, of the inferior spiritual levels, nevertheless they felt and divined that in olden times human beings could indeed penetrate far into the mystic depths of that realm which lies beyond all physical sense perceptions. There is a doctrine gray with age, still preserved in wonderful inscriptions in temples and upon columns. Parenthesis, it was thus, it was this doctrine to which the sage referred when he spoke to Solon. Close parenthesis. These inscriptions tell us of the broad and deep penetration of clairvoyant power in the remote past. The being to whom the Egyptians attributed all the profundity of their primordial clairvoyant enlightenment they called the great wise one, the old Hermes. When, at a later period, some other outstanding leader came to revive the ancient wisdom 
he also called himself Hermes, according to an old custom prevalent among exalted Egyptian sages, and because his followers believed that in him the primeval wisdom of the old Hermes lived once more. They named the first Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes. As a matter of fact, it was only the Greeks who used the name of Hermes, for among the Egyptians he was known as Thoth. In order to understand this being, it is necessary to realize what the Egyptians, under the influence of traditions concerning Thoth, regarded as true and characteristic cosmic mystics. Such Egyptian beliefs, as have come to us, one might say, from outside sources, seem very strange indeed. Various gods, of whom the most important ones are Osiris and Isis, are represented as not wholly human, often having a human body and an animal head, or formed of the most varied combinations of human-like and animal shapes. Remarkable religious legends have come down to us regarding this world of the gods. The veneration and worship of cats and other animals by this ancient race was most singular, and went to such lengths that certain animals were considered holy and held in the greatest reverence. In them the Egyptians saw something akin to higher beings. It has been said that this veneration for animals was such that, for instance, when a cat that had lived for a long time in one house died, there was much weeping and lamentation. If an Egyptian observed a dead animal lying by the wayside, he did not dare to go near it for fear that someone might accuse him of having slain it, in which case he would be liable to severe punishment. Even during the time that Egypt was under Roman rule, so it has been said, any Roman who killed a cat went in danger of his life, because such an act produced an uproar among the Egyptians. This veneration of animals appears to us as a most enigmatic part of Egyptian thought and feeling. Again, how extraordinary do the pyramids, with their quadrilateral bases and triangular sides, seem to modern humans, and how mysterious are the sphinxes, and all that modern research drags forth from the depths of this ancient civilization, and brings to the surface, to add to our knowledge an ever-increasing clarity. Th this question now arises. What place did all these strange ideas occupy in the image world of the souls of those olden peoples? What had they to say regarding those things that the thrice great Hermes had taught them, and how did they come by these curious concepts? We must henceforth accustom ourselves to seek in all legends a deeper meaning, especially in those that are the more important. It is to be assumed that the purpose of some of these legends is to convey to us, in picture form, information regarding certain laws that govern spiritual life and are set above external laws. As an example, we have the fable of the god Osiris and the goddess Isis. It was Hermes himself who called the Egyptian legends, quote, the wise counselors of Osiris, close quote. In all these fables, Osiris is a being who in the gray dawn of primeval times lived in the region where human beings now dwell. In the legend, Osiris, who is represented as a benefactor of humanity and under whose wise influence Hermes, or Thoth, gave to the Egyptians their ancient culture, even to the conduct of material life, was said to have an enemy whom the Greeks called Typhon. This enemy, Typhon, waylaid Osiris and slew him and then cut up his body, hid it in a coffin, and threw it into the sea. The goddess Isis, wife and sister of Osiris, sought her husband who had been thus torn from her by Typhon, or Seth. When she at last found him, she gathered together the pieces into which he had been divided, and buried them here and there in various parts of the land. In these places temples were erected. Later, Isis gave birth to Horus. Horus was also a higher being, and his birth was brought about through spirit influence, which descended upon Isis from Osiris, who had meanwhile passed into another world. 
The mission of Horus was to vanquish Typhon and, in a certain sense, re-establish control of the life current emanating from Osiris, which would continue to flow and influence humankind. A legend such as this must not be regarded simply as an allegory or as mere symbolism. In order to understand it rightly, we must enter into the whole world of Egyptian feeling and perception. It is far more important to do this than to form abstract concepts and ideas. For by thus opening the mind we can alone give life to the sentiments and thoughts associated with the ideal forms of Osiris and Isis. Further, it is useless to attempt to explain these two outstanding figures by saying that Osiris represents the sun and Isis the moon and so forth thus giving them an astronomical interpretation, as is the custom of the sciences of today outside of spiritual science. Such a theory leads to the belief that a legend of this nature is a mere symbolic portrayal of certain events connected with the heavens, and this is not true. We must go far back to the primeval feelings of the Egyptians, and using these as a starting point, try to realize the whole peculiar nature of their uplifted vision of the supersensible and conception of those invisible forces beyond human apprehension that underlie the perceptual world. It is the spiritual interrelation of these factors that finds expression in the ideal forms of Osiris and Isis. The old Egyptians associated these two figures with ideas similar to the following. There is a latent higher spiritual essence in all humankind that did not emanate from that material environment in which it now functions. At the beginning of earthly life it entered into physical bodily existence in condensed form, there slowly to unfold and grow throughout the ages. Our human state was preceded by another and more spiritual condition, and it is this primordial condition from which the human being gradually developed. The Egyptian said, quote, When I look into my soul, I realize that there is within me a longing for spiritual things, a longing for that true spirituality from which I have descended. I know that certain of the supersensible forces that operate in the region from which I come still live within me, and that the best of these forces are intimately related to the ultimate source of all super-perceptual activity. Thus do I feel within me an Osiris power, which placed me here, a spirit embodied in external human form. In times past, before I came to this state, I lived wholly in a spiritual realm, where my life was confused, dim, and instinctive in character. It was ordained that I be clothed with a material body, so that I should experience and behold a physical world, in order that I might develop therein. I know truly that in the beginning I lived a life that compared to this physical perceptual existence was indeed of the spirit. According to ancient Egyptian concepts, the primordial forces underlying human evolution were regarded as dual, the one element being termed Osiris, while the other was known as Isis. Hence we have an Osiris-Isis duality. When we give ourselves over to inner contemplation and are moved by the feelings and perceptions of the old Egyptians concerning this dualism, we at once find that we are involved in a process of active and suggestive thought leading to certain conclusions. In order to follow this mental process, We have only to consider the manner in which the mind operates when we think of some object, for instance a triangle. In this case, active thought must precede the actual conception of the figure. After the soul has thus, has been thus engaged in primary contemplation, we then turn our minds passively to the result of our thought concepts and, finally, see the fruit of our mental activity pictured in the soul. The act of thinking has the same relation to final thought as the act of conceiving to the final concept or activity 
to the result of activity or its ultimate product. Read that again. The act of thinking has the same relation to final thought as the act of conceiving to the final concept or activity to the result of activity or its ultimate product. If we contemplate our mental process when we picture the Egyptian past and are mindful of the mood of these ancient peoples, we realize that they looked upon the relation between Osiris and Isis in a manner somewhat similar to our conception of the order and outcome of thought activity. For instance, we might consider that activity should be regarded as a male or father principle, and that, therefore, the Osiris principle must be looked upon as an active male principle, a combative principle that imbues the soul with thoughts and feelings of potency and vigor. Bracket. We can form an idea of the old Egyptian concept concerning Osiris and Isis from the following considerations. Close bracket. In the human physical body are certain components, such as those that are active in the blood and those that are the basis of bone formation. The whole human system owes its being to the interaction of forces and matter, which combine to create and enter the material form. These elements can be physically recognized, but they are at one time dispersed and spread throughout the universe. A similar idea prevailed among the ancient Egyptians concerning their conception of the Osiris force, which was conceived as actively pervading the entire cosmos, as Osiris. Even as the elements that form the physical body enter into it, there to combine and become operative, so did those olden peoples picture the Osiris force as descending upon human beings to flow into their being and inspire within the power of constructive thought and cognition, the veritable Osiris force. On the other hand, the expression, quote, Isis force, close quote, was applied to the universal living cosmic influence that flows directly into the thoughts, concepts, and ideas of humankind. In this manner, we must picture the uplifted vision in the souls of the old Egyptians, and it was thus that they regarded Osiris and Isis. In the creation that surrounds us during our material existence, the ancient consciousness could find no words with which to express concepts such as these, for Everything about us appeals alone to the senses and has meaning and value only in a perceptual world, proffering no outer sign suggestive of a superphysical region. Thus, in order to obtain something in the nature of a written language which could express all such thoughts as moved the soul strongly, as for instance when the human being exclaimed, quote, The Osiris Isis force works within me, close quote, the ancients reached out to the script written in the firmament by the heavenly bodies. They said, quote, The supersensible power that the human being feels as Osiris can be apprehended and expressed in perceptual terms if regarded as that active force emanating from the sun and spread abroad in the great cosmos. The Isis force may be pictured as the sun's rays reflected from the moon which waits upon the sun so that she may pass on the power of his radiance in the form of Isis influence. But until she receives his light, the moon is dark, dark as a soul untouched by active, uplifting thought. Close quote. When the old Egyptian said, quote, The sun and the moon that are without reveal to me how I can best express figuratively my ideas concerning all that I feel within my soul, close quote. he knew that there was some hidden bond, in no way fortuitous, between these two heavenly bodies that appear so full of mystery in the vast universe, the light-giving sun and the dark moon ever ready, every, ever ready to reflect his splendor. He realized as well that the light dispersed in space and when reflected must bear some unknown but definite relation to those supersensible powers 
of which he was conscious. When we look at a clock, we cannot see what it is that moves the hands so mysteriously, apparently with the aid of little demons, for all that can be seen is a mechanism. But we know that underlying the whole mechanical structure is the thought of the original designer, which had its origin in the soul of a human being. In reality, the mechanism owes its construction to something spiritual. Just as the movements of the hands of a clock are mutually related and fundamentally dependent upon certain mechanical laws of the universe, and, finally, upon those that are operative in the human soul, parenthesis, as when one speaks of experiencing the influence of the Osiris-Isis force, close parenthesis, so are the movements of the sun and moon interrelated, and these bodies appear to us as indicators on the face of a mighty cosmic clock. The Egyptian did not merely say, quote, The sun and moon are to me a perpetual symbol of the relation between Osiris and Isis. Close quote. Indeed, he felt and expressed himself thus, quote, That force which gives me life and is within, under, and is within underlies the mysterious bond existing between the sun and moon, and it, likewise, endowed them with power to send forth light. Close quote. In the same way as Osiris and Isis were regarded with reference to the sun and moon, so were other heavenly bodies looked upon as related to different gods. The ancient Egyptians considered that the positions of the various orbs in space were not symbolic merely of their own supersensible experiences, but likewise of those that tradition told them had been the experiences of seers belonging to the remote past. Further, they saw in the cosmic clock an expression of the activity of those forces, the workings of which they felt in the ultimate depths of the human soul. Thus it came about that this mighty clock, this grand creation of moving orbs, so wondrously interrelated with others that are fixed, was to the Egyptians a revelation of those mysterious spiritual powers that bring about the ever-changing positions of the heavenly bodies, and thus create a universal script that humankind must learn to know and recognize as a means whereby super-perceptual power is given perceptual expression. Such were the feelings and perceptions that had been handed down to the old Egyptians from their ancient seers regarding a higher spiritual world of the existence of which they were wholly convinced, for they still retained a last remnant of primeval clairvoyant power. These olden peoples said, quote, we human beings had our true origin in an exalted spiritual realm, but we are now descended into a perceptual world in which manifest material things and physical happenings. Let me read that again, excuse me. Quote, we human beings had our true origin in an exalted spiritual realm, but we are now descended into a perceptual world in which manifest material things and physical happenings. Nevertheless, we are indeed come from the world of Osiris and of Isis. All that is best and which strives within us and is fitted to attain to yet higher states of perfection has flowed in upon us from Osiris and from Isis and lives unseen within as active force. The physical human being was born of those conditions that are of the external perceptual world and his material form is but a garment clothing the Osiris-Isis spirit within. Close quote. Predominant in the souls of the old Egyptians was a profound sentiment concerning primeval wisdom, which filled their whole soul life. The soul may indeed incline toward abstract notions, particularly the mathematical concepts of natural science, without in any way touching the moral and ethical factors of its life or affecting its fate or state of bliss. For instance, there may be discussion and debate relative to electrical and other forces without the soul's being moved to enter upon grave questions 
concerning humanity's ultimate destiny. On the other hand, we cannot ponder feelings and sentiments such as we have described regarding the spirit world and the inner relation of the soul's character to Osiris and Isis without arousing thoughts involving humankind's happiness, future, and moral impulses. When the mind is thus occupied, our meditations are prone to take this form. Quote, there dwells in me a better self, but because of what I am within my physical body, this better self is repressed and draws back. It is therefore not at first apparent. An Osiris and an Isis nature are fundamental to me. These, however, belong to a primordial world, to a bygone golden age, to the holy past. Now they are overcome by those forces that have fashioned the human form. But the Osiris-Isis power has entered and persists within that mortal covering that is ever subject to destruction through the external forces of nature. Close quote. The legend of Osiris and Isis may be expressed in terms of feeling and sentiment in the following manner. Osiris, the higher power in human beings, which is spread throughout cosmic space, is overcome by those forces that bring about utter degeneration in all human nature. Typhon confined the Osiris force within the body, as in a coffin formed to receive the human being's spiritual counterpart. There the Osiris element lies, concealed, invisible, and unheeded by the outer world. Parenthesis, the name Typhon has a linguistic connection to the words Auflösen, meaning to dissolve, and Verwesen, meaning to decompose. Close, close parenthesis. The Isis nature, hidden within the confines of the soul, was always mysterious to the Egyptians. They thought that at some future period its influence would bring humankind back to that state which they enjoyed in the beginning, and that this return would ultimately be brought about through the penet penetrative force of intellectual power. They fully recognized that in humanity there is a latent disposition that always strives to re-endow Osiris with life. The Isis force lies deep within the soul, and its profound purpose is to lead human beings step by step away from their present material state and bring them back once more to Osiris. So long as human beings do not cling to the physical, it is this Isis force that makes it possible for them, parenthesis, even though they remain outwardly physical in a material world, close parenthesis, to detach themselves from their perceptual nature and henceforth and forevermore look upward from within their being to that more exalted ego which, in the opinion of the most advanced thinkers, lies so mysteriously veiled at the very root of human powers of thought and action. This being, not the outer physical one, but the true inner human being, who has ever the stimulus to strive toward higher spiritual enlightenment, is, as it were, the earth-born son of that Osiris, who did not go forth into the material world, but remained as if concealed in the realms of the spirit. In their souls the Egyptians regarded this invisible personality that struggles toward the attainment of a higher self as Horus, the posthumous son of Osiris. It was thus that these old Egyptians visualized, with a certain feeling of sadness, the Osiris' origin of the human. At the same time they looked inward and said, quote, The soul has thus retained something of the Isis force that gave birth to Horus, the possessor of that never-ceasing impulse to strive upward toward spiritual heights. And it is in that sublimity that the human being will once again find Osiris. It is possible, close quote, I believe, it is possible for present-day humanity to bring about this mystic meeting in two ways. The Egyptian said, quote, I have come from Osiris, and to Osiris I shall return. Because of my spiritual origin, Horus lies deep within my being, and Horus leads me on, back to Osiris, to his father, 
who may alone be found in the world of spirit. For he can in no way enter into human beings' physical nature. There he is overcome by the powers of Typhon, the external forces that underlie all destruction and decay. Close quote. There are but two paths by which Osiris may be attained. The one is by way of the portal of death. The other passes not through the gateway of physical dissolution, for Osiris may be reached through initiation and the consecration of life to sacred service. Under the title, Christianity as Mystical Fact, I have gone more fully into this belief. The Egyptian conception was as follows. When human beings have passed through the portal of death, and after certain necessary preparatory stages have been completed, they come to Osiris. Being freed from the earthly envelope, there awakes in them a consciousness of actual relationship with that supreme deity. They realize that henceforth they will be greeted as Osiris, for this form of salutation is always bestowed upon those who have experienced death and entered into the world of spirit. The other pathway that likewise leads back to Osiris, that is, into the spiritual realms, is by way of initiation and holy devotion. Such was regarded by the Egyptians as a method through which knowledge might be gained of all that is supersensible and lies concealed in human nature, in other words, of Isis or the Isis power. We cannot penetrate into the depths of the soul and thus reach the Isis force within by virtue of mere earthly wisdom born of the experiences of daily life. Nevertheless, we have the means at hand whereby we may break through to this inner power and descend to the true ego, there to find that this same ego is ever enshrouded by all that is material in the human physical disposition. If indeed we can pierce this dark veil, then do we find ourselves at last in the ego's spiritual home. Thus it was that the old Egyptian said, quote, you will descend into your own inner being, but first comes your physical quality, with all that it may express of that self that is yours. Through this human disposition must you force a way. When you regard the stones and the justness of the way they are made, when you consider the plants and their inner life and the wonder of their form, and when you look upon the animals about you, there, in these three kingdoms of nature, you behold the outer world as engendered by, of spiritual and supersensible powers. But when you stand before a human being, look not alone upon the outer form, but seek that which is within, where abides the soul's strength, even as the Isis force. Close quote. In connection with the rites of initiation, there were included certain instructions as to what things should be observed during such time as the soul might remain incarnated. The experiences of all who have descended into their innermost being have been fundamentally the same as those that come about at the time of passing, differing only in the manner of their occurrence. Bracket, one might say that if this method of approaching the spirit realms were followed, then, close bracket, human beings must pass through the portal of death while they yet live. They must learn to know the change from the physical to the superphysical outlook, from the material to the spiritual world. In other words, they must acquire knowledge of the metamorphosis that takes place at the time of actual death. In order that they may obtain such enlightenment, those who would become initiated must take the way that leads them into the very depths of their being, for in this way alone may true understanding and experience be attained. When this method is employed, the first real inner experience is connected with the blood, as formed by nature. The blood is the physical agent of the ego, just as the nervous system forms the material medium in connection with the three ultimate modes of consciousness, feeling, willing, and thinking. We have already referred to this matter in a previous lecture. According to the ancient Egyptians, 
those who desire to descend into their being in order to realize a profound association with the primary material media must first pass down into the physical etheric sheath and enter the etheric confines of the soul. They must learn to become independent of that force in the blood upon which they normally rely. They can then give themselves up to the workings and the wonder of the blood's action. It is essential that humans first thoroughly understand their higher nature with respect to its physical aspect. To do so, they must learn to view the material being as a detached and wholly separate object. Now, the human being can recognize and be fully conscious of an object as a specific thing only when external to it. Thus they must learn to bring about this relation with respect to the self, if they would indeed comprehend the actuality of their being. It was for this reason that initiation was directed toward the development of such powers as enabled the soul forces to undergo certain experiences independently of physical media or or agents so that finally the aspirant could look down from such media objectively, in the same way as the human spiritual element looks down upon the material body after death. The primary duty of those who would know the Isis mysteries was to acquire knowledge concerning their own blood, after which they underwent an experience that can be best described as, quote, drawing nigh unto the threshold of death. Close quote. This was the first step in the Isis initiation, and those who would take it must have the power to regard their blood and being externally, and to pass into that sheath which is the medium of the Isis nature. Further, neophytes were led before two doors within some holy sanctuary, the one closed and the other open. As they stood in that place, there came before them visions depicting the most intimate experiences of their lives, and they heard a voice saying, quote, It is thus that thou art. So dost thou appear when thou beholdest thy true self pictured in the soul. Close quote. How remarkable are these teachings, the echoes of which are still heard after thousands of years have passed, and how wonderfully they harmonize with the human being's present-day beliefs even though they have since received materialistic interpretation. According to the ancient Egyptian seer, when human beings take the initial step and come upon the world of their inner form, they are there confronted by two doors. Quote, Through two doors shalt thou enter, thy blood and thy innermost being. Close quote. The anatomist would say, quote, through two inlets situated in the valves on either side of the heart, close quote, bracket. There are two pairs of valves in the heart, one on one side and one on the other. In each case, when one of these valves is open, in order to let the blood flow into a part of the system, the adjacent one is closed, close bracket. They who want to penetrate beneath the outer form must pass through the open door, for the gateway that is closed merely confines the blood to its proper course. We thus find that the results of anatomical investigation are certainly analogous to those born of clairvoyant vision in olden times, although they are not so clear and accurate as are the conclusions of the modern anatomist. Nevertheless, they portray what the clairvoyant consciousness actually apprehended when it regarded the human being's inner form from an external standpoint. The next step in the Isis initiation was what one might call the proving or profound study of fire, air, and water. During this period, initiates gained complete knowledge of the sheath quality of their Isis being of the properties of fire and how it flows in the blood, using it as a medium, and becomes fluid. They also received instruction about how oxygen infiltrates into the system from the air. All this wisdom descended upon them, the understanding of fire, air, and water, the warmth of breath, 
and the true nature of the fluidity of the blood. Thus it came about that aspirants, by virtue of the knowledge they acquired of their sheath quality, through their newly born comprehension of the elements of fire, air, and water, became so purified that when their vision at last penetrated beneath the enfolding envelope, they entered into their own Isis nature. We might say that it was at this point that initiates felt for the first time they were in contact with their actual being, that they were able to realize they were indeed spiritual entities, no longer limited by their external relation to humanity, and that they truly beheld the wonder of the spiritual realms. It is a definite law that we can look upon the sun only in the daytime, for at night it lies concealed by matter. But the powers in the spiritual world are never thus veiled to those who have acquired the true gift of sight, for they are best discerned when the physical eyes are closed to all material things. Symbolically, in the sense of the Isis initiation, we would say, quote, that person who is purified and initiated into the Isis mysteries may discern that spiritual life and power to which the sun owes its origin, even though there be darkness as at midnight. For, metaphorically speaking, such a person may at all times behold the great orb of day and come face to face with the spirit beings of the super-perceptual world. Close quote. Such was the description of the method, or one might say the path, leading to the Isis forces within. We are told that it could be traversed by all who during earthly life would but earnestly seek the deepest forces of the soul. There were, however, yet higher mysteries. The mysteries of Osiris, in which it was made clear that through the medium of the Isis forces, and by virtue of those supersensible, primordial, spiritual powers to which human beings owe their origin, they could exalt themselves even further and thus attain to Osiris. In other words, they were initiated into those methods by which the human soul might be so uplifted as to at last enter upon the presence of that supreme deity. When the Egyptians wished to portray the nature and character of the relation between Isis and Osiris, they had recourse to the special script that is written in the firmament by the passage of the sun and moon, while in the case of other spiritual powers reference was made to the movements and interrelations existing between the various stars. Most prominent among the astronomical groups in such portrayals was the zodiac, with its condition of comparative immobility and the planets that move across its constellations. It was in the revelations of the heavens, as manifested in spiritual symbols, that the old Egyptians found the true method of expressing those deep feelings that touch their souls. They knew that no earthly means were competent to indicate clearly the vital purpose of that urgent call to seek the Isis forces, that humankind might, through their aid, draw nearer to Osiris. These old Egyptians felt that in order to describe this purpose fittingly, they must reach out and make use of those bright groups of stars that ever shine in the firmament. Hence it would appear that in the beginning written characters were brought down to the earth from the vault of heaven. We must thus regard Hermes, the great wise one, who according to Egyptian tradition lived upon the earth in the dawn of antiquity and was endowed with the most profound clairvoyant insight concerning the human being's relation to the universe, as having possessed, to a high degree, the power of apprehending and explaining the true nature of the connection between the constellations and the forces of the spirit world, and of interpreting the signs portraying events and happenings as expressed in the language of the stars in terms of their mysterious interrelations. Now if in those olden days it was desired to enlighten the people with regard to the nature of the bond existing between Osiris and Isis, this matter was put forward in the form of an exoteric legend. 
but in the case of the initiates, the subject was treated more explicitly by means of symbolic reference to the light that emanates from the sun and is reflected by the moon and the remarkable conditions governing its changes during the varying phases of the latter. In these phenomena, the Egyptians found a practical and genuine analogy, expressive of the sacred link between the Isis force within the human soul and that supreme spiritual figure, Osiris. From the movements of the heavenly bodies and the nature of their interrelations, there originated what we must regard as the very earliest form of written characters. Little as this fact is yet recognized, we would nevertheless draw attention to the following statement. If we consider the consonants of the alphabet, we note that they imitate the signs of the zodiac in their comparative repose, while the vowels and consonants are connected in a way that may be likened to the relationship that the planets and the forces which move them bear to the constellations of the zodiac as a whole. The sentiments that moved the ancient Egyptians when their thoughts turned to Hermes were such as we have described, and they realized that his great illumination came from those spiritual powers that called to him out of the heavens, prompting him with counsel concerning that activity which persisted in the souls of humankind. And more than that, he was instructed even in the deeds of everyday life, and in those directions in which such sciences as geometry and surveying were needed. Both of these Pythagoras learned from the Egyptians, who ascribed all this knowledge to the primordial wisdom of Hermes. One might say that the old wise one saw in the interrelation of all things spread abroad upon the earth a counterpart of that which exists in the firmament and finds expression in the mystic writings of the stars. It was the thrice-blessed Hermes who first gave this stellar script to the world and through its aid and in the dawn of Egyptian life instilled into the minds of the people the elements of the science of mathematics while he adjured them to look up to the heavens there to seek guidance even regarding mundane matters. The very life of the Egyptian nation in that olden time was dependent upon the overflowing of the Nile and the deposits that had swept down from the mountainous country to the south. We can therefore readily understand how absolutely essential it was that there should be a certain pre-knowledge of the date of the coming of flood periods, so that they might anticipate the accompanying changes in natural conditions thus brought about in the course of any particular year. In those early days, the Egyptians still reckoned time according to the stellar script that was written in the canopy of heaven. When Sirius, the dog star, was visible in the sign of Cancer, they knew that the sun would shortly enter that part of the zodiac from whence its rays would shine down upon the earth and conjure forth as if by magic the life brought to the earth by the deposits of the overflowing Nile. For this reason they looked upon Sirius as, in quotes, the watcher, who gave them warning of what they might expect, and the movements of Sirius formed part of their celestial clock. They gazed upward with thankful hearts, for the timely warnings of their watcher enabled them to cultivate and tend their land in such a way that it might best bring forth all things necessary to external life. When such questions of import as these arose, these old Egyptian peoples sought enlightenment and guidance from those writings that they saw spread across the firmament. At the same time, they looked back into that dim gray past when first they had learned that the passage of the stars was in truth an expression of movements among the parts of some mighty cosmic clock. In Thoth, or Hermes, they recognized that great spirit who, according to their ancient traditions, set down the very earliest chronicles concerning cosmic wisdom. From the inspiration that came to him through the wondrous stellar script, Hermes conceived the forms underlying the physical alphabet, 
and through their aid taught humankind the principles of agriculture, geometry, and surveying. Indeed, he instructed them in all things needful for the conduct of physical life. Physical life is nothing but the embodiment of that spiritual life so deeply interwoven throughout the cosmos, and it was from the cosmos that the spirit of wisdom descended upon Hermes. It was evident to the Egyptians of that period to which we refer that the influence of the great wise one was still active throughout their civilization, and they felt that this mystic bond was both profound and intimate in character. The method adopted by the old Egyptians for the purpose of time calculations, and which continued in use for many centuries, was convenient in operation and lent itself readily to all simple computations of this nature. They regarded the years made up of exactly 365 days, which they divided into twelve months, each having thirty days, leaving five days over which were accounted for separately. But modern astronomy tells us that if this method were to be employed, one quarter day every year is not taken into account. Bracket, the actual difference is six hours, nine minutes, and nine seconds. Close bracket. Therefore, the Egyptian year came to an end one quarter day too soon. This difference gradually spread backward through the months until a coincidence was reached at the beginning of a certain year. Such coincidence took place every four times 365 years. Thus, after the lapse of 1,460 years, the terrestrial time estimate would be for a moment in agreement with astronomical conditions, because at that particular moment the sum of the annual differences would be equivalent to one whole year. Let us now suppose that at a certain time in 1322 BCE, an Egyptian looked up into the heavens. There, At that moment, any visible constellation would occupy a definite position in the firmament, bracket, which position could be used as a basis of computation, close bracket. If we calculate backward over a period of three times 1460 years from 1322 BCE, we come to the year 5702 BCE. It was at some time prior to this date to which the Egyptians ascribed the dawn of that primordial holy wisdom which came to them in the beginning. They said, quote, In bygone times, human beings' power of clairvoyance was truly at its highest. But with the passing of each great sun period, bracket of 1460 years, which brought about the balance of terrestrial reckoning, close bracket, the divine gift of clear seeing gradually faded, until in this fourth stage in which we now live it is weak and ever failing. Our civilization reaches far into the remoteness of antiquity, where the voice of tradition is all but stilled. In thought we hark back beyond three long cosmic periods to that glorious and distant past when our greatest teacher, his disciples, and his successors imparted to us the elements of the ancient wisdom that now finds expression, albeit in strangely altered form, in the character of our script, our mathematics, geometry, surveying, our general conduct of life, and also in our study of the heavens. We regard the cosmic adjustment of our human computation with its convenient factors of twelve times thirty days and five supplementary as a sign that we were ever subject to correction by the divine powers of the spirit world, because through error of thought and reason we have turned away from Osiris and from Isis. We cannot with exactitude measure the year's length, but when our eyes are raised on high, we can gaze into that hidden world from whence those spirit powers ever guide the courses of the stars, remedy our faults, and bring harmony where the human being has failed to find the truth. Close quote. From this it is clear that the old Egyptians realized the feebleness of human beings' powers of intellect and understanding, so that even in the case of their chronology they sought the aid of those higher spiritual forces and beings 
beyond the veil, beings who correct, watch over, and protect humankind during the activities and experiences of earth life, bringing to bear upon these problems the mystic laws of the great cosmos. Hermes, or Thoth, was held in greatest veneration as one inspired by the ever-vigilant heavenly powers. And in the souls of these ancient peoples, this outstanding personality was looked upon not merely as a great teacher, but as a being who was indeed exalted, and whom they regarded with the most profound feelings of reverence and thankfulness, so that they cried out, quote, All that we have comes from thee. Thou went on high in the dim gray dawn of antiquity, and thou hast sent down by those who were the carriers of thy traditions all that flows throughout external civilization, and which is of greatest human service. Close quote. With reference to the actual creator of all supersensible forces and those who watch over them, as well as Osiris and Hermes or Thoth, the Egyptians not only felt in their souls that they were imbued with knowledge begotten of wisdom, but indeed experienced the sentiment in the deepest moral sense of greatest veneration and gratitude. The graphic descriptions of the past tell us that the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians was permeated throughout with a certain religious quality and mood, particularly noticeable in olden times, but by degrees these characteristics became less and less marked. In those days the people felt all knowledge to be closely associated with holiness, all wisdom with piety, and all science with religion. As this attitude waned, it gradually decreased in purity of form and expression. A similar change has taken place throughout the evolution of humankind among all those various civilizations whose mission has been to alter the trend of spiritual thought and lead it in some wholly new direction. When each nation had reached the pinnacle of achievement and its task was ended, there followed a period of decadence. The greater part of our knowledge concerning ancient Egyptian culture is connected with an epoch of this nature, and the significance of all that lies beyond is merely a matter of conjecture and supposition. For instance, what is the true meaning of that extraordinary and, to us, grotesque worship of animals in that bygone age, and of the curious feeling of awe we experience when our thoughts dwell upon the pyramids? The Egyptians themselves tell us that there was an era during which not only humankind, but also beings from the higher spiritual realms descended upon the earth. This was in the beginning, before the knowledge and wisdom that was then granted had truly developed and become active. If we would indeed know the innermost nature of human beings, we must not alone regard the outer form, but penetrate to the true self within. All external qualities with which we come in contact are but stages of manifestation that have remained in situ, one might say, and are seen as if representing in powerful, albeit diminutive imagery, ancient principles dominant in the three kingdoms of nature. Consider the world of minerals and of rocks. Here we find those same relations of form that human beings used in the architecture of the pyramids. The inner forces of plant life are expressed in the beauty of the lotus flower. And, distributed along the path that culminates in the human being, we find in brute creation existences that have not attained to the higher level of humanity. They are a sort of crystallization of divine forces that have been embodied and scattered abroad in separate and distinct animal shapes. We can well imagine that the feelings of the old Egyptians gave rise to thoughts of this nature when they recognized in animal life a manifestation of the unaltered primordial forces of the gods. For they looked back into the gray past, when all earthly things were begotten of divine supersensible powers and developed under their guidance. From this concept the Egyptians conjectured that among the creations in nature's three kingdoms, certain of these higher primal forces, which had lived 
on, unchanged over a long period, had ultimately undergone some intimate modification that had raised them to that higher standard exhibited in the human form. When considering these ancient peoples, we must ever have regard for their feelings and perceptions and the necessities of their life. It is from these factors that we can best realize how close was the moral bond between their wisdom and the soul, so that the latter might not swerve from the path of rectitude and morality. The Egyptians believed that because of the manner in which the spirit world was created and fashioned by the divine supersensible powers, there must be some definite moral relation that extends to the creatures of the animal kingdom. The grotesque and singular modes in which this concept ultimately found expression came about only after the final decline of the nation had commenced. From the study of the later periods of Egyptian culture, it is clear that human frailty and imperfection were unknown in primordial times, for we learn from this source that in the early dawn of Egyptian life, civilization was of a high standard, and it was then that humans knew and experienced the most intimate divine spiritual revelations. We must not fall into that error, so common in our days, of assuming that all forms of human culture had their inception under the most simple and primitive conditions. In reality, it was only after the impulse imparted by those first glorious blessings had waned and a period of decline had set in that human life became crude and uncultured. For this reason, we should not look upon the barbaric tribes merely as peoples in whom intellect is expressed in its most elementary form, on the contrary, you must consider the aboriginal races as representative of civilizations that have fallen away from some exalted primordial state. This assertion is not at all to the liking of that branch of science which would have us believe that all culture had its inception under the most elementary conditions, such as those still found among the savages of our time. Nevertheless, spiritual science affirms by virtue of knowledge obtained through the medium of its special methods, that the primitive states of humankind are in truth manifestations of long-perished civilizations, and that all human life had its inception under cultural conditions directly inspired by divine beings, mentors from the spirit world, who descended to the earth in the dim dawn of antiquity, and over whose deeds is cast a veil impenetrable to external history. Human beings have long believed that if we trace life's course backward through the ages, we should in the end arrive at childish conditions, similar to those found among barbaric peoples. It was certainly not expected that in, do in so doing we would find ourselves confronted with noble and exalted concepts and theories. Spiritual science definitely asserts that if we peer into the past, at the beginning of human life we shall not find rudimentary cultural states, but instead lofty and glorious civilizations, which at some later period fell away from their first high spiritual standard. At this point we might well ask, quote, does this assertion, as advanced by spiritual science, bring it into conflict with the results of modern scientific research? the logical methods of which delve deeply and without prejudice into all matters that come within the scope of its investigations? Close quote. Let us see how external science itself replies to this question. With this object, I will give a literal quotation from a recent work by Alfred Jeremias, bracket licentiate doctor and lecturer at the University of Leipzig, close bracket, entitled, entitled The Old Testament, in the light of the ancient East. From the text we learn that external science, while engaged in the gradual unfoldment of ancient history, has reached back into the remote past and there found traces of a highly spiritual primeval civilization whose culture was imbued with the most momentous and intellectual conceptions. It is further emphasized that those cultural states which we are so accustomed to term barbaric, 
should in reality be regarded as typical of primordial civilizations that have fallen away from some higher level. The actual quotation to which I have referred is as follows. Quote, the earliest records, as well as the whole ancient civilized life about the Euphrates Valley, indicate the existence of a scientific and at the same time religious theoretical conception that was not confined merely to the occult doctrines of the temple. In accordance with its precepts, state organizations were regulated and conducted, justice declared, and property administered and protected. The more ancient the period to which we can look back, the more absolute does the control exercised by this concept appear. It was only after the downfall of the primal Euphratian civilization that the influence of other powers began to make itself felt. Close quote. Thus do we honor and revere Hermes, even as we venerate the great Zarathustra. To us he shines forth as one of those grand, outstanding individualities, veritable leaders of humankind the very thought of whom engenders a feeling of enhanced power within and begets the certain conviction through which we know that the spirit is not merely abroad in the world, but in fact weaves beneath all earthly deeds and is ever active throughout the evolution of humanity. Then are our lives strengthened, a fuller confidence is in our every action, hopes are assured and destiny stands out the more clearly before us. It is at such times that we exclaim, quote, Those yet to be born will surely lift up their hearts to the glorious spirit mentors who were in the beginning, and will seek the truth of their being in the gifts that are of the inner forces of the soul. They shall acknowledge and discern in the ever-recurrent impulses that come as an upward urge to humankind the workings of a divine power, and the eternal manifestations of those great ones from the spirit world. Close quote. From this excerpt it is clear that external science has truly made a beginning toward the opening up of new paths that tend to bring harmony and agreement into those matters, so often regarded as controversial, that it is the province of spiritual science to bring forward and impress upon our present civilization. In a previous lecture we have drawn attention to a similar progress in connection with the science of geology. If in the future we continue to advance in like fashion, we shall gradually be compelled to recede further and further from that dull and lifeless conception that would have us regard all primordial civilization as primitive and childish in its nature. Then indeed shall we be led back to those great personalities of the remote past who seemed to us the more transcendent, because it was their divinely inspired mission to endow a still clairvoyant people with those priceless blessings that are evident throughout all cultural activity in which we now play our part. Such noble spirits in human form as Zarathustra and Hermes at once claim and rivet our attention. They appear to us so exalted and so glorious because it was they who in the dim dawn of human life gave to humanity those first most potent and uplifting impulses. The old Egyptian sage had this sublime concept in mind when he spoke to Solon concerning doctrines gray with age. And that's the end of le uh, okay, that's the end of the lecture. There is an addendum. I will read this and include this in the lecture. Uh, this addendum, I believe, is by another person. Addendum. This lecture was delivered in Berlin on February 16, 1911. Since then, external science has probed further into the secrets of that highly advanced, primal, civilized life in the valley of the Euphrates, to which reference has been made on page 65. The following brief outline will indicate some of the results of archaeological research carried out in Mesopotamia at the site of the ancient city known as Ur of the Chaldees. Ur is spelled U-R. Important discoveries have been made at this place in connection with ancient Euphratian civilization as the outcome of a joint expedition arranged by the British Museum and the Museum of the University of Pennsylvania in 1922 under the direction of C. Leonard Woolley. 
In a lecture given before the Royal Society of Arts on November 8, 1933, and that appeared in their journal, Dr. Woolley said, quote, Certainly the discoveries that we made at Ur in the last ten years have tended to set scientists by the ears rather than satisfying them with the new information obtained. Few surprises in recent years have been so great as that occasioned by the excavation of the great cemetery lying beneath the ruins of Ur. Close quote. In the vaulted chambers of rubble mason read that again, in the vaulted chambers of rubble masonry, in the tombs of kings, dating as far back as thirty five hundred BCE, were found treasures of gold, silver, mosaic, and others, made by the Sumerian workers and of a degree of technical excellence, unsurpassed by the craftsmen of today. In one case, when referring to an especially fine specimen of polychrome art that is now known as the ram caught in a thicket, Dr. Willie drew attention to the fact that this particular sculpture, while characteristic of the work of the ancients in 3400 BCE in the Near East, was actually suggestive of that of some rather late Italian Renaissance artist. As the investigations proceeded, it became abundantly clear that the ancient people who had so skillfully fashioned the strange and wonderful treasures brought to light were not Tyros or novices, T Y R O S, Tyros or novices, they must have had behind them long traditions, long apprenticeship. With the view of obtaining insight into the history of this bygone and highly developed civilization, excavations were commenced at a point that was actually the ground level of 3200 BCE. There, through a depth of over 60 feet, relics of the dim past were unearthed in clearly marked strata. Traces of eight superimposed cities were revealed, and deep down beneath the remains of an ancient pottery factory, so Dr. Woolley tells us, the excavators, quote, suddenly came upon a mass, eleven feet thick, of water-laid sand and clay, perfectly uniform and clean, which was undoubtedly the silt thrown up by the flood. Close quote. We can, he continues, quote, said Dr. Woolley, actually connected with the flood which we call Noah's Flood, close quote. The verge of this deluge was found to be up, quote, against the flank of the mound on which stood the earliest and most primitive city of Ur, close quote. Below this deposit were, quote, the remains of antediluvian houses. The lowest human buildings rested upon black organic soil, and that, in turn, went down below sea level, close quote. The excavations proved that the ancient Sumerian architects were familiar with concrete, at the beginning of the 4th millennium BCE, and possibly earlier. They were acquainted with every basic form of modern architecture. And Dr. Woolley further states that there is no doubt that, quote, the arch, the vault, the apse, and the dome, used in Europe for the first time in the Roman period, close quote, specimens of which were found among the ruins, continue, quote, are a direct inheritance from the Sumerian peoples of the 4th millennium BCE, at least and they may, may well go back to a date still more remote, close quote, italics added. Further, it has been shown that continuity in Sumerian civilization undoubtedly extended from the 5th millennium BCE up to the 6th century BCE. This fact has come to light as a result of discoveries made by digging beneath the foundations of a massive staged tower known as the Ziggurat of Ur, the main religious building of the city. And by tracing the dates and character of cylinder seals of different periods carried by these bygone peoples for the purpose of signing written documents. Toward the close of his most interesting lecture, Dr. Woolley stated that imports into Egypt before the First Dynasty seemed to indicate that the Sumerians imparted to the then barbarous people of that country an impulse that enabled them to develop their remarkable civilization. He further said, quote, Civilized as the Babylonians were, they made no new discoveries at all. They hardly advanced beyond what their predecessors had known, and they preserved civilization rather than invented it. We know, too, that the Sumerians sent out the ancestors of the Hebrews with all the traditions of law, civilization, religion, and art, which they had themselves enjoyed in their home country, and which the Hebrews never entirely forgot but by which they were profoundly influenced.
close quote. Thus has this joint archaeological expedition, under the able leadership of Dr. Woolley, thrown the light of modern external science upon one of those glorious spiritual civilizations of the dim gray past, so often referred to by Rudolf Steiner, which endured just so long as its people opened their hearts to the guidance of the Spirit, but fell away and perished when they left the true path and gave themselves up to material things.